Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. Uh, this is one of over a thousand programs that we've done since the pandemic began. And we're very pleased to have uh, Avi Loeb, Professor Avi Loeb, back with us. Um, he was here last year and he has lots of new information. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank Wonderfest for having supported this program. And let me tell you a little bit about Professor Loeb. Um, professor at, uh, I think Frank Baird, uh, professor at, uh, of astronomy at Harvard University, used to be the chair there. Um, special visiting professor at uh, Weizmann Institute. Let me get the, the details straight here. Uh, visiting professor at the Weizmann Institute of Science, the senior professor by special appointment at Tel Aviv University. He's the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative and the head of the Galileo Project. Um, he received his PhD when he was just 24 in plasma physics from Hebrew University of Jerusalem and was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where he started his work in theoretical astrophysics. Um, quite a resume. <laughs> and, and one of the things that I wanted to, to, to do first was let's get the updated news. You, 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 for those of you who haven't been following his work in the New York Times and everything else, um, he has found particles from what we know to be, or you can explain why we know that, what we know to be uh, an interstellar meteor, something that came from outside. That doesn't mean it's an interstellar spacecraft, but an interstellar meteor from outside. The three. And the spherules have been found in the bottom of the ocean. I'd like you to tell us how precise is the science to be able to go, you, I know that the, there was a record from 2014 of the meteor going into the water. But it's still pretty hard to pick up the things that are left behind off the bottom of the ocean. We can't find ships that go down. So explain, explain a little bit about that and, and, and what's the latest that in the analysis? I know the analysis has just started, but tell us about that. It must be very exciting. Yeah, so um, this was a very challenging task and I'll describe it in more detail in, in my talk, but um, uh, it was uh, uh, as challenging as finding uh, uh, grains of sand of a particular type at the bottom of the ocean that is more than a mile deep across a region that is seven miles in size. And, um, you know, um, obviously it was a risky uh, project to follow, but uh, by succeeding in finding what we were looking for, uh, I think we demonstrated that um, innovation in science uh, sometimes pays off. And uh, otherwise, if you tell yourself that you will not find anything and you don't search, obviously you will not find anything. Mm -hmm. So life is a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's better to be an optimist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> moreover, if we want to gain new knowledge, we should not be trapped by the chains of past knowledge. We should allow ourselves uh, to be open-minded and search. And I will describe the details of exactly what we searched for and what we found. But the one thing I wanted to mention is when I entered the, the jet, the private jet that took us uh, to uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, the pilot uh, said, welcome aboard, Professor Loeb. And I said, no need to call me professor. You can just call me Avi, uh, because fundamentally I'm a, a curious farm boy. Mm -hmm. And I offered you the opportunity to call me a curious farm boy at the introduction because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone that knows me from my childhood would testify that I haven't changed much. I'm connected to nature. I was very interested in philosophical questions and I, I'm very grateful to be able to use the scientific method to address some of these questions like, uh, are we alone? Do we have a neighbor out there? Uh, and uh, really science is about seeking the evidence. It's not about saying or uh, describing what is an extraordinary claim and saying we can't really discuss it because we don't have an extraordinary evidence. It's about seeking the evidence. Mm -hmm. And most of those people who are reserved about the question of whether we have a neighbor, uh, they don't seek any evidence. So again, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And um, I don't think they have a right to express their opinions because science is not about opinions. Mm -hmm. It's about seeking the evidence, looking for materials, analyzing them in the laboratory and figuring out what nature tells us. And you know, we, we have many examples where nature didn't tell us what we were thinking it would tell us. We thought that we are the center of the universe. 
Turns out we are not. Mm -hmm. We uh, <laughs> arrived to Earth just a few million years ago. That's one part in 10,000 of the age of the universe. And so if you arrive to a, st a play, uh, at the end of the play, and you are not at the center of stage, the play is not about you. Hmm. And you better seek other actors who can tell you what the play is about, which is pretty much what I'm doing. Yeah, you make it very clear in your book that you, you, you're uh, interested in finding people who are more intelligent than you have available on our planet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was uh, jogging on the ship, on the deck, every morning at sunrise, as I do on land. And... Uh, uh, the director of the filming crew that uh, was there, I, mean, I had 50 uh, filmmakers and producers who wanted to be there, we chose one. Uh, he asked me, he said, Avi, you are running, are you running away from something or towards something? And I said both. I'm running away from some of my colleagues who have very strong opinions without seeking evidence. Mm -hmm. And I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. Yeah, well, Let's hope that there is higher intelligence in interstellar space. Um, but it is tough when you're working on a project and you figure out who's the smarter person that I can go to to ask questions to, you know. Um, so, um, but let's, let's talk about this elephant in the room just a little bit because the, the word controversial is kind of getting attached to your name the way billions and billions was, got attached to Carl Sagan's name uh, when he was talking. And um, it just seems like you know, like the Galileo project is based on, as you say, on the scientific method, and you just want to get more evidence. And, and so the question is, does it make sense to get evidence? And if you have somebody funding you to get evidence, it doesn't matter how reasonable it is or not. There's all kinds of, of, of you know, if you're taking it from the government and they've paid taxes, I, I guess they can complain. But that's different. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. So, I mean, I find it really strange because there are people who uh, define themselves as scientists and they are appalled at me following the scientific method of collecting evidence uh, materials and uh, studying them in the laboratory. They have a problem with that. And, um, you know, some of the people who are the, the strongest critics of what I'm doing, they don't even write scientific papers. They, uh, many of these bloggers and uh, uh, science popularizers mm -hmm. who, um, you know, they haven't written a single scientific paper over the past decade, yet they are very popular talking about science, which the way, uh, for, from my view is uh, uh, just like commentators looking at a soccer match and telling the players how to pass the ball. You know, I'm a <laughs> practicing scientist. Uh, I don't need people from uh, the audience to tell me what to do. And they pretend uh, they're preaching as if they represent how science should be done. They haven't written a scientific paper. I wrote a thousand of them. I keep writing every week uh, scientific papers. Mm -hmm. And so I find it really puzzling that they define what science is supposed to be. And the other thing is, you know, the public is very interested in this question. And one of my critics was uh, mentioned by the Crimson at Harvard, the, the, the magazine of uh, students. Uh, he was saying, uh, well, of course, there is some jealousy at the attention that Avi Loeb gets, uh, but uh, it's about time that reporters will pay more attention to boring science. <laughs> and, um, you know, that makes very little sense to me. I mean, yeah. if your science is boring, why should you ask reporters to pay attention to it? You should do something that the public resonates with. And, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest items is, uh, are we alone? And there is no reason for us to shy away from a scientific inquiry into this question. In fact, most people care about it more than the nature of dark matter on which scientists spend billions of dollars over the past few decades and didn't find the answer to. So if we were to spend billions of dollars on searching for technological objects sent by other civilizations, and, it, and within a few decades, we will not find anything, you know, we would be exactly the same point as dark matter searches are right now. And uh, I believe that this subject belongs to the mainstream. And that's why people uh, attach controversial to what I'm doing. It's not controversial at all. If you ask, you're like two thirds of the public believe that that is a very exciting frontier of research. How can it be controversial? It may be controversial to those who prefer to avoid the public, to those who believe that they are superior to the public intellectually. But I don't feel that way. 
I feel that I'm in service of the public and government right now because the word extraterrestrial was mentioned multiple times last month at the House of Representatives. Yeah. So if there is a question we care about, why not explore it scientifically? And I do it to the best of my ability. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think you make that very clear in your book, but also in the methods that you use. Um, you know, even if you're exploring something that's unusual, as, as you said, the idea about dark matter is also unusual, and um, we have no evidence for that at all. Uh, so the, uh, one of the colleagues, uh, one of your colleagues that I know, mentioned that maybe it's not jealousy and some, as much as it is the fact that you're humble and you say that Earth is a D-class civilization, and, and nobody wants to hear that we're a D-class civilization. So that might be part of it, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's true, but um, my hope <laughs> is that by uh, getting a wake-up call from yeah. a neighbor, uh, we might uh, aspire to do better. Because if you look ob objectively you know, at the news every day, it doesn't look like we are intelligently using our resources. We spend $2 trillion a year on military budgets. And if we were just uh, uh, more uh, you know, open to the idea that we should work together because we are in the same boat. Mm -hmm. uh, with an extra $2 trillion a year, we could send a space probe, a CubeSat, towards every star in the Milky Way galaxy, mm -hmm. billions of them, by the end of this century. And so that's a sign of intelligence, uh, being able to send the uh, objects that escape from the gravitational pull of the Earth, because uh, no other species on Earth is able to do that. And what separates us from nature, life as we know it on Earth, it's the ability to launch rockets that escape from uh, the rock that we were born on. So let's uh, do that rather than uh, get engaged in conflicts among us, which serve no good purpose, are just a waste of energy and money. And clickbait. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe it's all the advertisers' fault that they do that. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, um, why don't we get the, uh, the presentation lined up? I have a question for you about dark matter, um, but we'll okay. do it after your presentation since that's a sideshow. All right? Okay. Okay, so I'll be glad to start my presentation. Thank you very much. So, um, well, the first slide was... Uh, the cover of my book that just came out, the Interstellar, which talks about these issues that we were just mentioning. It's also the punchline of the scientific paper we just had uh, completed last week, uh, which uh, provides uh, the results from the first analysis of those molten droplets from the first uh, interstellar meteor. Mm. Uh, and I'll describe the results uh, in a few slides. Uh, but first, a few words about the Galileo project that uh, I'm uh, leading uh, for two years now. Um, the goal is to find objects that originated from extraterrestrial technological civilizations because we launched uh, five probes to interstellar space. Um, there were Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, and New Horizons. And that's over a period of uh, half a century and other civilizations that had the benefit of science and technology for a longer period uh, could have launched many more. So you could find in the interstellar medium of the Milky Way galaxy, perhaps a lot of space trash. Uh, these are objects that are not functional anymore. And every now and then one of them might come close to Earth. And so this project aims to look for those. Maybe there are some functional devices and so one thing we are doing is uh, uh, we built an observatory at Harvard University that uh, monitors the sky 24-7 uh, for any objects uh, that might be technological in origin, but not, not from this Earth, because the U.S. government uh, talks about those. Uh, there was a hearing in the House of Representatives just last month about it. Uh, so we want to see if there is anything more than uh, natural objects belonging to Earth, like birds, um, human-made objects like balloons, drones, airplanes, um, anything else uh, from outside of this Earth out there. You, so uh, we have... you mentioned that, that the, the, the uh, government has this information, but they're not re revealing all of the information. And if your idea is to scan the whole sky and get a catalog of everything that's out there, that would make it yes. hard for them to hide anything. Right. I mean, uh, the government is uh, 
classifying data that is obtained by classified sensors, just because the sensors uh, are classified and they don't want adversaries to be aware of them, but the sky is not classified. So we are monitoring the sky. So let me include the, a short video that has a few words about the instruments that we are using. Welcome to an overview of the Galileo Project's development site, codenamed Pigeon Run. Our instrumentation suite consists of both wide field and narrow field sensors. Wide field sensors are used for target selection and tracking, while narrow field sensors gather higher resolution data on potentially anomalous objects. Our main instrument is DALEC, a hemispherical array of eight infrared cameras. Next to it is the ALCOR, a secondary high resolution optical all sky camera. Together, these instruments continuously monitor and track objects in the sky, analyzing them in real time for potential anomalous activity. This is AMOS, our acoustic monitoring omnidirectional system designed to detect and record acoustic signatures across the infrasonic, audible, and ultrasonic bands. AMOS also houses an ADS-B antenna for logging aircraft transponder data, allowing us to quickly separate known from unknown objects. Here we have Skywatch, a multi-static passive radar system designed to detect and track multiple objects simultaneously, measuring object positions and kinematics. And Pac-Man is an environmental monitoring system for measuring local weather conditions. Sensors include an anemometer, temperature and pressure sensors, a particle counter, and a flux gate magnetometer. Next up is Spectre, a radio spectrum analyzer with a wide band antenna for measuring radio and microwave emissions. Beacon is currently our only narrow field instrument. Beacon is a high resolution pan tilt zoom camera capable of 40 times optical zoom. Our instruments collect a wide range of data, all of which is fed to our computing enclosure housed beneath the Dalek and Alcor instruments. Here, data is processed and analyzed in real time. Objects detected and tracked by the wide field instruments are localized in 3D space and analyzed for unusual characteristics. Selected targets are then sent to the Beacon PTZ for follow-up observation. Finally, data is recorded to disk and uploaded to the cloud via Starlink. These combined systems comprise the current version of the observatory class system, with many refinements, additions, and upgrades scheduled for near-term implementation at Pigeon Run. We are planning an extension of the system uh, so that we would be able to triangulate uh, and figure out distances of objects in the sky and also uh, planning to make uh, copies of the first system at Harvard and place them in various locations within the US. Uh, we are looking for funding that would allow us to have uh, up to a hundred such uh, uh, copies. And uh, for now we have uh, four uh, copies that are uh, uh, secured in terms of funding. Um, and uh, we also are analyzing satellite data from uh, a partnership with Planet Labs, uh, looking at objects from above rather than from below. Um, and uh, we have plans for continuing to uh, more sophisticated systems in the future. Uh, we've written uh, about eight papers describing the current uh, observatories that we are building. So now let me uh, move on to the to another branch of the Galileo project, which is uh, related to interstellar meteors. And um, I had the 43 diary reports uh, in uh, medium.com. You can just find them by going to avilob at medium.com. Uh, they received uh, millions of uh, readers uh, throughout the world. They were translated to Spanish. A lot of people told me that it's the first time they had a, uh, the opportunity to witness uh, the scientific process, the way it's done, where, you know, at first you are unsure about things, uh, you make mistakes along the way, and then the evidence eventually guides you to the solution. So let me show a few images from this uh, expedition. Uh, with uh, We were uh, on a ship that was called Silver Star, so that's the reason for the background music that you will hear. Drifting in my sister thinking I am where you are drifting in my sister thinking 
thinking I am on the way you are drifting in my sister thinking I am on the way you are drifting in my sister thinking I am So the story starts in uh, uh, on January 8th, 2014, where uh, when uh, government U.S. government uh, satellites detected the fireball from uh, an object half a meter in size that uh, exploded in the lower atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, and what was unusual about it is that it was moving very fast. Relative to Earth, it was moving at 45 kilometers per second, but it was actually moving from behind the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. If it were to collide head-on with Earth, it would have been moving at 90 kilometers per second. Uh, just to mention that the, the speed of a car in a highway is 90 kilometers per hour. Here we are saying the same distance that a car passes in one hour, this object was passing in one second. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and uh, we calculated that outside, in fact, the obje object uh, was unbound to the sun because it was moving so fast above the escape speed from the solar system. And outside the solar system, it was also moving very fast at 60 kilometers per second relative to the local frame of the Milky Way galaxy, the so-called local standard of rest. And that is faster than 95% of all stars in the vicinity of the sun. And moreover, we calculated that uh, because it was able to sustain uh, the extreme stress, uh, even though it was moving so fast through the atmosphere, it was actually tougher in material strength than all space rocks cataloged by NASA over the past decade, 272 of them. So it was tougher than iron meteorites. And uh, that, of course, raises the possibility that it may be a Voyager-like meteor. Imagine Voyager, the spacecraft we launched out of the solar system, uh, leaving the solar system and colliding with a planet like the Earth far away. Uh, it would appear as a meteor of unusual strength and unusual speed uh, because it's made of stainless steel and also w benefited from propulsion to start with. So uh, uh, we wrote a scientific paper saying this is the first recognized interstellar meteor. That paper was not uh, accepted for publication because the uh, reviewers argued, we don't believe the US uh, government, uh, the measurements may be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it took three years until the U US uh, Space Command issued a formal letter to NASA on March 2022, you, you can see it on the left, where they checked the data and verified at the 99.999% confidence that this object indeed was unbound to the sun. It's an interstellar meteor based on its high speed. And at that point, I decided to lead an expedition to search for the materials of this object because it was so unusual. It released a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy Mm -hmm. to about 500 kilograms of matter. And so this matter evaporated, but also uh, melted uh, to make droplets. And those are the ones that we were looking for at the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the US government released also the light curve of this uh, meteor, and it showed the three flares separated by roughly a tenth of a second from each other. Uh, we translated that to the um, stress exerted on the object as it was moving through air and uh, realized that indeed it's tougher in material composition, material strength than all meteors that were cataloged by NASA, 272 of them, because they exploded at much lower stress than that. Um, so at any event, um, the US uh, Department of Defense provided an error box for the location of the fireball, which uh, uh, had an uncertainty of about uh, seven miles uh, in, in length. And uh, we were able to narrow down the path, the expected path of the meteor by using uh, the sonic boom from the explosion 
that arrived to a seismometer on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. And knowing the time delay, just like when you hear a thunder mm -hmm. and you uh, get it with a, some time delay relative to the light, uh, you can tell the distance. And we were able to narrow down the path of the meteor to within a strip that you see here, the, the, this red strip that is the overlap between a, a, a fixed distance from the seismometer and the error box of uh, the Department of Defense. So that's where we went. And uh, this is the team of about 28 uh, people that joined me on this trip. And uh, gladly, uh, a few months after I announced the intent to go to the expedition, uh, a donor approached me, uh, Charles Hoskinson, and said, you have the money, one and a half million dollars. It was quite expensive. And that was one of the possible failure points where nothing would have happened without this funding. And uh, we, uh, rented this uh, ship, uh, Silver Star. What you see behind the team is what is called the A-frame, which directed the cable connecting a sled that we built, one meter in width, 200 kilograms, and we put the sled on the ocean floor, connected with a cable to the ship. The, the length of the cable was three miles, and the depth of the ocean was more than a mile. And this sled was one meter in width, and we were pulling it, just like mowing the lawn back and forth 26 times, crisscrossing the region of interest, trying to see whether we collect any magnetic particles left over from this meteor uh, that rained down during the explosion and uh, collected on the ocean floor uh, almost a decade ago. How many times did you have to bring that up? You were oh, mowing the lawn. How many times. times did you have to empty it? 26 times. So we went back and forth 26 times. Yeah. And, you know, they, they would uh, happen at intervals of less than eight hours. And uh, I would not sleep for more than a few hours uh, at a time because we some many of these uh, sled uh, runs uh, returned in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And um, so here you see some images that in the middle and the right side, you can see the bringing up of the sled from the ocean and then they would put it on the deck and we would scrape the magnets from any particles that were attached to it and uh, in the first day we couldn't get the sled to lie on the ocean floor because the cable would lift it up it was kiting and then the engineers realized that we need to uh, move along with the currents so that we keep the sled on the bottom of the ocean what you see on the left uh, uh, bottom images uh, is me jogging one morning with uh, the filming crew uh, filming it, as I mentioned before. So this is how the sled came back every time and we would scrape the uh, magnets uh, or use a vacuum uh, uh, cleaner, as you can see, to soak all the, I mean, to basically uh, collect everything that was on the magnets, not to miss any uh, material uh, that was attached to the magnets. Uh, and I'll show you how the sled uh, went. We had the um, video cameras attached to the sled, so they took a picture of it. Uh, you can see here how uh, what what it looked like mowing the lawn uh, at the bottom of the ocean a mile deep. So um, that's a mile uh, down. You said a mile under the. Yeah, there is life. Uh, down there, uh, we saw some shrimp and um, many rocks that, uh, as you will see, it will go over one of these rocks in a few seconds. And um, the thing is that we were collecting, I mean, most of it is muck, but we were collecting magnetic particles on the magnets. And uh, um, these were mostly volcanic ash, uh, black powder, uh, tiny particles. Uh, that we filtered out with uh, a mesh. And uh, here you see that uh, a rock uh, being taken for the ride. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, we couldn't collect uh, large objects like this rock because we built the sled for those spherules, the tiny marbles that are molten droplets from the surface of the object. Okay. Were you able to adjust the height of it when you saw that rock? Could you watch that in real time and adjust oh, it? Oh, no, we didn't watch it in real time. The, uh -huh. the video okay. 
was recorded and then uh, brought to on deck so we didn't have a view of what is happening down there yeah and one one uh, in one of the runs the sled came back with a uh, white paint on it and uh, it looked like a painting of jackson pollock and, uh, <laughs> um, i immediately thought oh that's probably because there was a bucket with paint uh, at the bottom of the ocean that it ran into uh, that a sailor must have dropped from uh, the deck of a ship mm -hmm. a long time ago and uh, then uh, i took my finger and wiped it up and put it in a vial and we tested it with the x-ray fluorescence analyzer and found that uh, it's actually biological and we googled it and found that there is this gooey material at the bottom of the ocean that uh, the sled may have ran, ran into huh. um, anyway uh, that shows you how science is done you know you don't trust uh, your first uh, theory you have to test it well the um, most obvious answer was the sailor Right. Anyway. Yeah, that's, that was the, <laughs> to me the most likely explanation, but then it turned out to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, I wrote about it because you know it just shows you that science is like a detective story, and until you have evidence, you don't know. Uh, and so uh, uh, here you see the 26 runs that we had crisscrossing the region, and uh, uh, what you see on the left here is a whiteboard uh, that I put for us to. Uh, mark all of the spherules that we found. So after six days, we didn't find any. And I wrote in my diary report on the sixth day, I said, uh, where are the spherules? I admitted that we were not successful at finding what we are looking for. And then the following day, we started looking at big particles uh, under the microscope uh, after uh, using the mesh to filter out the black powder. And we did find uh, a spherule for the first time. I was thrilled to see that. I hugged the person who saw it first, mm -hmm. and I realized that just like finding an ant in the kitchen, you know, you know, you get alarmed <laughs> because you know that there are many more ants out there. So we found indeed 50 of them during the expedition, two weeks between um, June 14th to 28th uh, this year. Um, but then we brought them back, uh, the material back to Harvard. Uh, and uh, there uh, I had a summer intern, uh, Sophie Bergstrom, who found uh, uh, close to 600 of them. Uh, and so altogether we now have uh, almost uh, 700 spherules that we are able to analyze. You can see one of them here yeah. uh, with the tweezers approaching it. Uh, and uh, there are many more. You can see smaller ones uh, in the picture. They are very distinct from uh, the hush that surrounds them. And here are some images from the microscope on the deck. Uh, when my daughter saw these images, were, which were all over the news after I reported uh, in my diary report uh, about them, uh, she said, uh, could I have one uh, on a necklace? <laughs> I to her uh, that th these are less than a millimeter in size. You can't really thread them, but they're beautiful. <laughs> and here are uh, the babies we delivered. This is the delivery room. Uh, except uh, instead of beds, we have vials inside of which we have the babies. These are the spherules that we delivered. And there were 50 of them here in uh, in this container uh, coming back from the ship. Um, and uh, you can see the case that brought me all of them uh, delivered by FedEx. I did not want to keep it in my suitcase uh, uh, for the fear that uh, they will be lost at customs. and. Uh, I arranged for FedEx to deliver them. It took a few extra days, but I realized that it's not a big delay given that it took this material probably billions of years to arrive to Earth. So <laughs> two extra days is not, uh, too much. Uh, you can see actually the thunder uh, mm -hmm. on, on the left, uh, just to my right, uh, with a, a black um, uh, rain raincoat. I saw in your diary that you had a spheral that was three of them combined, so that it wasn't really formed into a sphere yet. Oh, yeah. So that's actually that very a very important spheral. I'll show it in a minute. Okay. So this is uh, on, uh, on the left is Sophie Bergson, who my summer intern, who wanted to become a science journalist, but then at some point said that, uh, you know, instead of just shadowing you, I'll be glad to help with the science. And I said, uh, I arranged a, a pair of tweezers and a microscope for her to look at the materials and she found the 600 of them uh mm. so she she became the spheral hunter <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then on on the other side is uh, uh, uh stein jacobson that uh, has the 
state of, of the art mass spectrometer that we use to analyze the composition of those spherules. They are both much taller than me. <laughs> um, and and uh, these are examples of the images that uh, Sophie uh, obtained of the spherules that she found. Uh, and these are images uh, that we obtained on the first day as we came back to the US from the expedition. Uh, we passed through uh, UC Berkeley because we arrived at San Francisco airport. And um, uh, we used a scanning electron microscope to look inside some of the spherules. And uh, lo and behold, we found the spheres inside spheres. And the way to understand it is that um, those uh, small spheres, they solidified very quickly. And then they were engulfed by liquid iron that glued them together. And you end up in a structure that looks like Russian dolls, where you have spheres inside spheres, mm -hmm. which is quite amazing. They look like eggs nested on a, as a matrix of dendrites. Mm -hmm. And here you see some more. So uh, the next step uh, was uh, for me to ask uh, my postdoc, Laura Domin, uh, to make a plot of the uh, distribution of uh, spherules. In other words, each run found a certain number of spherules, uh, thanks to Sophie finding all of them. Uh, and then um, um, we, uh, based on where the run went, uh, we can assign a yield to the number of spherules per unit mass collected. Most of the mass is background, volcanic ash. So per amount of volcanic ash, we gave a weight to each run as to how many spherules were recovered. And uh, what you see in this map, uh, first of all, on the left, you can see those control regions far away from the meteor path, which is uh, delineated in orange here. That's the expected meteor path. Mm -hmm. um, so far away, we went far away just to see the background. Uh, and then uh, close to the meteor path, we find these yellow regions, which have twice as many spherules per unit mass retrieved. Uh, and they may be related to the three flares that were observed out of this uh, meteor. And uh, you can see a zoom in uh, view uh, on the, in the middle of this uh, slide. And then the numbers of the runs that pass through these enhanced yield regions, the yellow regions, uh, these are runs uh, 4, 13, and 14. And amazingly, in those runs, we found a special type of spherules that is not found anywhere, that is unique, never reported in the scientific literature. And I'll explain uh, what they are. This is uh, one may of I, the May I ask one question about the three flares, just to understand the three flares. Those, those were, um, as the meteor was hitting the atmosphere at certain speeds, it exploded and some of it exploded and flared. And then at another speed, it, it, it flared again. And what was unusual about the fact that there were three big uh, flares? Oh, uh, the way to think of that is, uh, you know, when a meteor breaks up, it's an explosive process. Why? Because the amount of uh, heat generated is proportional to the area of the object. And uh, you know, the energy that it carries goes like its volume. And the more area you make, uh, the more heat you generate as a result of the motion. And so if you break the object into smaller pieces, they have more area per unit mass. Uh, because uh, the smaller a piece gets, the more area you get per unit mass, because the area goes like the size squared, whereas the volume goes like the size cubed. So if you make a small object, then uh, the area to volume ratio gets bigger and bigger as the object gets smaller. So breaking up the object makes more heat being generated. And uh, as a result, more break up because there is a huge explosion that releases heat that breaks up the object into smaller pieces. And that's why it's an explosive process. But the existence of three flares may indicate that the object broke up into three pieces and each of them had its own explosion at some point. And they were delayed by a tenth of a second. The object was moving at some speed and they basically separated from each other. So the way I would think about the three flares is that these are three major pieces of the original object. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and that's important because our next expedition would aim to find a bigger piece, perhaps, of this uh, meteor, and um, that we can search for in those yellow regions. That will be the location where we hope to find some uh, bigger pieces. Mm -hmm. Great. This Thank is you. one of the. Sorry. Thank you. That was great. Great explanation. Okay. This is one of the spherules that looks like a soccer ball, but is of no particular significance. This spherule is actually much more important. Uh, it's actually a merger of three spheres, as you can see, and it's one of the biggest that we found. It's lopsided. Um, and uh, when we analyze the composition, we found what you see in this diagram, which is the abundance of elements. On the vertical axis, it's the abundance normalized by the standard for solar system materials, okay? And uh, on the horizontal axis, you see elements starting from lithium and going in the periodic table all the way to uranium on the right side. And um, so one, the value of one on the vertical axis corresponds to abundances consistent with solar system materials. And when you look at various objects within the solar system, uh, those uh, meet other meteors, they often uh, have compositions that with abundances that vary between 0.1 and 10. So mm -hmm. you get some variations, but not more than a factor of 10. And here we found a composition uh, that has 300 times the beryllium abundance of the solar system materials and 600 times lanthanum and uranium uh, as well, getting close to a thousand times the solar abundance. So we call this composition Belau because it was never reported in the literature and uh, it has enhancements of beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium. Beryllium, I should say, is produced by breaking up uh, heavier nuclei uh, as a result of impacts by cosmic rays, energetic particles. So the beryllium may be a flag of interstellar travel uh, rocks in the inner solar system are not exposed to the same flux of cosmic rays because they are protected by the solar wind they're blocking most of the cosmic rays but an interstellar object would have an, an overabundance of beryllium which we see and then lanthanum to uranium including elements between lanthanum and uranium uh you know that the question is where does that come from and um one possibility is that you have a magma ocean planet where just like the earth started where rock is being liquefied by for example impacts or heating from the star and you end up with a magma ocean a lava planet and if it has an iron core then uh, uh, elements that have affinity to iron would be attracted to the core and separate from other elements and the other elements in the crust of the planet would be those that we see here enhanced so that would be a natural explanation. But another possibility is that it's technological in origin. Mm -hmm. And for some technological reasons, those elements are useful. And lanthanum, we know, is used in semiconductors. Uh, uranium, we know, is used in energy production, uh, in fission reactors. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Yeah, I have one uh, question and, about that. The ver yeah. wide variety of, of um, footprints of the different uh, elements, does that indicate less that it's uh, technologically created or more or is it irrelevant i mean it, would, it wouldn't be well, like stainless uh, steel is pure sort of thing right yeah it's hard to tell because um it goes through the cosmic you know, rays one, and one thing gets adjusted. Uh, yeah one thing i want to do is actually uh you know this looks like it's just like uh, the ingredients in a recipe book for cakes uh, so i hope to be able to take these elements mm -hmm. put them together uh and mix them and see what kind of a cake I get mm -hmm. uh, if I mix them at the right proportions. And, you know, one wonders if the material has some special properties. Maybe it's a superconductor, maybe, mm -hmm. who knows? So um, we can try and make this cake in the laboratory or on the computer. Mm. And uh, what you see here is the same plot now for five spherules that were showing this unusual pattern uh, from the runs that I mentioned before. And uh, uh, those special runs that uh, were passing uh, in the yellow regions. And uh, what you see is that the um, elements uh, that are volatile, so this is plotting elements as a function of their volatility, going uh, increasing to the right, 
which means uh, that the elements on the right can be easily lost by evaporation during the fireball phase. And indeed, we see them as underabundant. So uh, that's these are elements like lead or other elements that um, do not have a high abundance uh, just because they were lost uh, during the early fireball phase, the, the air burst. So, uh, so these are the uh, conclusions. And I uh, uh, just wanted to show one more thing that we did, which is a measure the isotope ratio of iron. So different isotopes of iron and the, uh, this particular spherule was completely off what you find on Earth. Uh, and uh, that implies that it's not from Earth, not from Mars, not from the Moon. Uh, this uh, spherule has uh, iron abundance ratio that is very different than uh, what we have here on Earth or Mars or the Moon. So um, altogether, you know, we could we have a fingerprint of an object from interstellar space, and this is a historic discovery because it's the first time that scientists analyzed materials from a big object that came from outside the solar system, and. Uh, you know, irrespective of whether it's natural or artificial in origin, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if it is artificial, of course, the question is, what was the postal address of this package? What did it come <laughs> from? And, uh, Harvard University. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that's to be found, of course. And uh, I'm very curious uh, uh, to go on the next expedition and find uh, any big pieces from the object, so, because they can tell us whether it's a rock uh, or a technological gadget. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to emphasize again that this expedition was risky because, uh, we, you know, at the beginning, we might have not gotten the needed the donation to fund the project. We might have not uh, recruited uh, qualified engineers and navigators to uh, help us. And they did fantastically well. I mean, they are really the best in the world. Uh, we could have not uh, built the proper machinery to accomplish the task. The sled may have not worked. Uh, we might have not been able to keep it on the ocean floor. Uh, we might have not found any spherules from I-1 because if you know it may have evaporated and not produced enough spherules for us to find. Uh, and even if we uh, had spherules, we might have not found them among the background particles. And then finally, after bringing them back, uh, we might have not have uh, access to the state-of-the-art mass spectrometer that allowed us to discover the Belau composition. So mm -hmm. I feel that it's like a miracle that all of these items uh, ended up successful. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the next expedition is the key to look for bigger pieces. And here you see me together with the party chief, uh, Art Wright, um, who is much older than I am by 20 years, more than 20, 25 years. And uh, he was uh, actually uh, the commander of uh, a destroyer during the Vietnam War and has a lot of experience uh, in ocean expeditions. And I was told that all of his expeditions were successful, including this one. <laughs> and here we are looking at the sunset uh, and planning the next expedition. I found him an, an amazing partner for this expedition because he wouldn't say much. Uh, and whatever he said was correct. Uh, so that explains why his last name is Wright. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, it was really a pleasure to work with people that were really uh, uh, acting like a team. And uh, it felt as if uh, we are all uh, part of, of uh, the same team that is on the same boat. You know, we're all in the same boat and everyone worked uh, selflessly for the success of the mission. That's a metaphor for how we humans should behave uh, on our boat, uh, the Earth, sailing through space. We should work together rather than fight each other. And more details about the significance of this uh, discovery are uh, described in my book, Interstellar. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Well, the next question that I have for you is, you, you, you've had this career for a long time in theoretical astrophysics. At what point did you suddenly get enthusiastic or, or over a period of time, really enthusiastic about this possibility of getting evidence of extraterrestrial life? I mean, because oh, that, it, it, that did was, something uh, happen or did you just gradually go? Yeah, 
Um, as I said, I'm guided by uh, data. And what happened was in 2017, uh, the PANSTARS telescope in Hawaii yeah. um, discovered uh, an interstellar object the size of a football field that, uh, that did not collide with Earth, but was reflecting enough sunlight for us to see it. Uh, it was called the Oumuamua, which is named uh, after, uh, after the, the Hawaiian word, the uh, scout. And um, um, it intrigued me because a decade earlier, uh, I predicted how many space rocks of that size should be out there. And we predicted that the uh, Panstas will not find any. Mm. And uh, when your prediction turns out wrong, you know, uh, that's a, a sign that nature sends that you might be uh, discovering something new, some new knowledge. Mm. And to me, that was very intriguing. Uh, and I should say that's very different from the approach that some of my colleagues have taken, because uh, when I returned from the expedition, uh, there was a paper accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal about this meteor that I went after. And the paper said, well, we can't fit the data that the US government provided on this meteor with our model for stones. Um, and uh, as a result, we argue that the data must be wrong, that in fact, the measurement of the velocity was off by a factor of three. The velocity was much smaller. This was actually a stone from the solar system and not from interstellar space. And uh, I call that the stone age of science. <laughs> everything in the sky must be stones. If yeah. you're not allowing yourself to learn something new, you will never learn it. And so in the case of Oumuamua, I said, OK, I was wrong. You know, the, here is the data and we should understand it. And then the more data we got on this object, the more peculiar it looked. Uh, it was flat in its shape based on the reflection of sunlight as it was tumbling. And moreover, it was pushed away from the sun uh, without showing any cometary evaporation, the way comets uh, are being uh, propelled by the rocket effect. And so I suggested that it's pushed by reflecting sunlight. And sure enough, uh, three years later, the same telescope in Hawaii found another object. And that one was definitely propelled by reflecting sunlight and uh, uh, did not show any cometary evaporation. And three weeks later, they realized, the astronomers realized, it's actually a rocket booster that was launched by NASA in 1966. Mm -hmm. And it had thin walls made of stainless steel. That's why it didn't evaporate. But it, th these were thin enough walls for the object to be pushed by reflecting sunlight. So here we have it, an example for a thin object manufactured by technology. And we know that because we produced that object, 2020 SO. Uh, but the question is, who produced Oumuamua? Who produced the first interstellar meteor? Why are they so different than asteroids or comets that we are familiar with? Why are they not stones? And that's you know what I'm hoping to figure out and collect more data in the coming years. Yeah, in your book, you, you, you say one of the things we should spend money on is to uh, have a launch availability for something that can go and chase one of these things and get it up close. I mean, that would, right. because uh, now, um, I can't pronounce it, but that- Oumuamua is, Oumuamua is gone. Uh, You're not gonna yeah. be able to get it anymore. Yeah, so you know, after a successful date, if the partner goes out of the door and you don't have any contact information, it's better not to obsess with that one. Yeah. Uh, the uh, practical uh, lesson would be to look for similar ones in the future. And th there is a Rubin Observatory in Chile that will uh, hopefully survey the southern sky every four days with a camera that has 3.2 billion pixels. A thousand times more pixels than your cell phone camera. And uh, hopefully it will find a few Oumuamua like objects uh, in the coming years every year. So we can then study them with a web telescope, with uh, telescopes on Earth. Now that we receive the alert that objects like Oumuamua exist, mm -hmm. we should uh, study them more carefully in the future. So, uh, a big part of your book, um, which we don't have time to go into, but I want to at least mention it is how do we prepare for alien encounters and you're 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 not talking about you don't think that there's going to be a biological creature or anything it's it's what you're talking about these technological things your you your whole idea is to send out get guided by ai uh, you know technological our technological information to other places take it take it in and send the information back and think that maybe other people are doing this uh, outside but not that you're 
So I, I thought it interesting, but I, uh, one of the things that I was wondering in, in preparation for this um, is, should we learn to talk to certain animals or, 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 or test it out? Because you'd think that their language would be easier to, f to figure out than somebody else's. But yeah. you make a really good point that physics and, and math are gonna be the, the language, so. Well, gladly we have uh, developed uh, AI, artificial intelligence, that has a similar number of connections already uh, you know, these uh, la large language models uh, mm. like uh, ChatGPT that has a similar number of connections to the number of synapses in the human brain has similar complexity. And within years, we will have systems that are more uh, sophisticated, more complex than the human brain. And I, I'm uh, betting on those helping us to figure things out. Mm. Uh, so we will not be limited to human intelligence. Uh, but um, uh, all you know it's uh, really uh, important for us to be open minded and uh, collect any evidence about objects out there uh, and um, you know we it will inspire us uh, to explore space ourselves uh, it will uh, educate us about our technological future uh, there is a lot to be learned uh, from observing our neighborhood and finding a neighbor out there I have to ask you this one question because I think it, 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 it goes right to the heart of your ability to be persuasive. And that is that you, you say in your book that if you had the opportunity that you would leave the planet and go with it, to be able to learn more. And although it took a while, you, you persuaded your wife that she's willing to go with you. And I, I'm impressed that you have that ability to persuade. And I, I, I was wondering if you had any trick to share with all the other husbands. <laughs> well, I think the, the key, I mean, if you ask her, then I still have a lot to learn, by the way. But <laughs> the key is to, uh, is to be modest. And that's true also of the interaction with the universe, you know, because the lessons we get from the universe are often uh, be modest. Uh, you are not at the center. You're not the smartest. Uh, Albert Einstein was probably not the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang. And, uh, you know, we should just study from nature and figure out things uh, based on evidence rather than claim that we know the answer in advance. Because as a kid, you know, I was mostly frustrated by asking a difficult question and uh, seeing the adults in the room uh, dismissing the question and pretending mm. uh, that it's not important just because they didn't know the answer. I thought that by becoming a scientist, I will be able to answer questions myself. Uh, but what I find is that my colleagues, uh, scientists, um, also try to behave like the adults in the room and uh, they don't admit our ignorance and they have very strong opinions before we collected evidence to guide us. So uh, a sense of modesty is helpful in uh, marriages. It's also helpful uh, for our work as scientists. We should just allow nature to educate us because it's much more imaginative than we are. Uh, we are limited by our experiences on this rock, the earth, and uh, the universe has much more real estate and many more possibilities <laughs> yeah. uh, to uh, expand our imagination. Well, it doesn't sound, if you were asking those questions at five years old, that you're just a normal farm boy. I'm sorry, Avi. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question here that, that you answered already, which is, uh, besides velocity, wouldn't a meteor from beyond our solar system have an unusual trajectory? You, you, you just said, yes, yes, it has it had a different trajectory as well. Right. And here's, I should here's mention a question that which you, if we, if, yeah. uh, just in that context, if we had a chance to um, date the duration of the journey, for example, by using radioactive isotopes, uh, then uh, since we know the velocity of the meteor outside the solar system, if we multiply by the duration of the journey, we'll get the distance that it came from, and we know the direction. So in principle, it's possible to pinpoint uh, the source star from where it came. Hmm. If we can only date uh, the age of uh, the meteor, but that's not easy. Yeah, okay. Um, here's one that you cover in your book, so I, I like the question. Should we, humanity, be discouraged by the negative results of 60 years of SETI research? Well, no, because the, it's a, a completely different approach. It's uh, waiting for a radio signal to reach us, and this is just like waiting for a phone call at home. Uh, nobody may call us when we are listening, especially since we've been uh, checking only for a century for any radio signals. In fact, less than that, 70 years. Uh, and um, most civilizations that predated us 
are probably dead by now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the radio signals they sent a billion years ago are not around anymore. Uh, just think about how much time we have left on Earth for life as we know it. It's less than 20% of the lifespan of, of the Earth, uh, because within a billion years, the sun will burn up uh, the surface of the Earth and uh, boil off all the oceans. We won't be able to stay here. And there must have been cries for help from other civilizations that died by now, but we were not around to listen to them. Uh, you know, cosmic uh, history is full of tragedies, I'm sure, of uh, planets that do not have life anymore. Just like Mars, you know, it had liquid water and then it became a desert after losing its uh, liquid water and the atmosphere. So uh, the same could happen to many civilizations. They may not be around. And, um, uh, but if they send any probes to interstellar space, these probes keep accumulating over time, just like plastics in the ocean, uh, because they're bound by gravity to the Milky Way galaxy. And um, the question is, how much, how many of them are in our neighborhood? Mm -hmm. This is not a theoretical question. This is a question that we can address by searching our backyard for any tennis balls that were thrown by a neighbor. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we just started over the past decade. So it's a relatively new frontier. And uh, obviously, it's worth <laughs> investing in this uh, because the first two interstellar objects, the meteor and then Oumuamua, didn't look like asteroids or comets that we are familiar with. So we should uh, get more data on objects like them. Uh, you covered uh, one of the comments that was here. Uh, it was mostly a, a shout of despair. Uh, they said, I thought we had almost five billion more years to survive on this planet before the sun expired. And now you tell us that within a billion years, all the water will be gone. That's only 20% uh, of the time, but um, well, there it is. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think the solution, well, there is one solution that I discuss in the book, which is similar to Noah's uh, Ark in yeah. the biblical story, uh, trying to save uh, animals by putting them on an ark and saving them from the great flood. And I talk about Noah's spaceship, but that's the brute force approach. Another approach would be to send the artificial intelligence uh, astronauts uh, to space. And let me explain why that is crucial, AI, systems because it takes light, you know, tens of thousands of years to cross the Milky Way galaxy. So the the probes that we send to interstellar space cannot wait for guidance mm. from the sender. Right now we have Perseverance rover, we have the Ingenuity uh, helicopter on Mars, but they are being managed by engineers in the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And this, I call this helicopter parenting because we are actually parenting a helicopter on Mars. Uh, but also because it's like uh, you, you give instructions to those gadgets how what to do. And that is not a wise approach when you send something out of the solar system. You have to let it be autonomous uh, so that uh, it can decide what to do. And uh, our, it needs a brain. Uh, artificial intelligence is a very good uh, approach to supplement the uh, uh, technological gadget with the ability to think and digest data. And we haven't yet sent uh, any AI system to space, but I think that will be the future. And therefore, if we ever encounter something, it will not be, uh, uh, it will not have pilots that are biological because they are unlikely to survive the travel for millions or billions of years. My, my sense is it will most likely be, uh, you know, a gadget with, if it's functional, with uh, AI and uh, AI astronauts, and the, the advantage of that is you can equip them with uh, 3D printers so they can use the raw materials, such probes can use the raw materials on the planet that they arrive to and uh, uh, try to recreate what the, whatever the sender wanted them to, to uh, do. And so you can, in principle, recreate life as we know it. By the way, nature does it with, uh, for example, the dandelion seeds are mm -hmm. carried with by the wind and they land wherever they land and use the nutrients in the soil to uh, make new dandelion seeds using the DNA that they carry. And we can imagine doing the same using technology. I should say that we are very late in being able to imitate uh, nature. Mm -hmm. it, you know, the Wright brothers, uh, 120 years ago, were able to fly when we saw birds for, you know, um, <laughs> thousands and thousands of years doing it. Uh, we just last December, we were able to create fusion 
in the laboratory at Livermore when the sun is doing it for billions of years. Uh, we don't have cars that heal themselves, uh, you know, if they get a minor uh, collision, uh, just like the human body recovers from a minor scratch. Uh, and, uh, you know, it will obviously take us time to develop a self-replicating probe. There is no 3D printer that makes 3D printers right. at the moment. Uh, but I think the, in the future, a century from now, that might be possible. Yeah, the, the model is out there. That, as you say, the model is in nature. It's very, very obvious that's how it's done. Um, it's a couple of quick uh, technological questions. One's from Paul Gupta. He asks whether what you think of Cornell's work on atmospheric spectral sig signatures, whether oh, you think that that's um, interesting information. Yeah, definitely. Um, in 2015, I wrote a paper uh, suggesting that uh, searching for industrial pollution uh, might be a good method for finding technological civilizations uh, that pollute, I should say industrial civilizations, because it's not clear that they are intelligent if they pollute <laughs> the planet. But, um, uh, <laughs> but um, um, that's uh, something that can be searched for with the web telescope. There was just another paper uh, a few weeks ago suggesting the same and going into more details. Um, another thing you can search for is uh, city lights on a planet. Um, in addition to the starlight that is uh, being reflected from the planet's surface. And mm -hmm. uh, that's another thing we could potentially check with the Webb telescope, whether there are any planets that emit much more light than they are supposed to, because they have city lights on them. Um, so um, altogether, you know, the mainstream of astronomy is focused on looking for uh, biomarkers. These are molecules that may be indicative of microbes, uh, very primitive forms of life. Um, uh, you know, to me, these are not very interesting. And it's not obvious that we will be successful at inferring the existence of microbes before we find technological uh, uh, signatures, because uh, it's, uh, the technologies could be much more distinct from uh, anything else, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, you can get confused by looking for specific molecules. They might not be produced by biology. Maybe they are produced by natural process. But, you know, if you see at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean uh, a gadget with, uh, uh, with buttons on it, uh, and you know that it came from this meteor because of its composition, mm -hmm. um, then, uh, you know, the question is, should we press a button? Last question like that. Um, is there any scientific basis uh, to think that space elevators can overcome the tyranny of rockets? Do you know anything about space elevators? Uh, yeah. Idea? Uh, the issue with space elevators is that uh, one needs uh, a wire that has on which the, the elevator is attached uh, to be of uh, exceptional material strength. And uh, people looked into uh, various materials uh, it's still not, it doesn't look like it's practical at the moment, even though we develop very strong materials. Mm -hmm. uh, but in principle, uh, you know, that is a fascinating way to go to space. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, nobody has a, a working uh, plan for how to make a space elevator at the moment. All right, well, let's end with one question about dark matter, since, since you use dark matter as something that people have pursued without. The, the, the basis of it, the theoretical basis of it, without any other evidence, is that the, our universe is expanding in all directions. Now, if we just... Well, it's, this is not the only... Uh, that's not the only uh, thing, uh, yes. But, yeah. but it's part of it. Um, so if you, just took, if you just took as a thought experiment that the Big Bang took place in a vacuum, and all the parts... I mean, the explosion took place, and the first, the first edge of it is going the fastest, um, because there's no friction, nothing else is there. It leaves some debris behind, so there's some friction, things slow down, so that there's different speeds as we can see it. And you assume that it's going out in a sphere, not just this, but we only see one light cone of it. Now, well, if, you're, you, if, you if we're in the middle, yeah. hmm? if we're in the middle. Just, uh, what you just described is what happens inside an exploding star, actually. Right. It has a so-called Hubble flow inside of it. Uh, where slow material is moving behind fast material. Uh, that's uh, from our vantage point, that's what happens in the expanding universe. But the difference is that as far as we can see, the density of matter in the universe is the same everywhere, uh, mm -hmm. or at least started the same everywhere, to one part in 100,000. 
all the way out to our horizon. And yep. that makes uh, a very different uh, uh, solution in the context of Einstein's theory of gravity. It means that um, it's really, you know, space could, I mean, the conditions can go even farther than the horizon. In fact, there is an argument that they go at least 4,000 beyond 4,000 times beyond the distance that we can see since the Big Bang. There is right. a finite distance we can see that light travels since the Big Bang. And so there is this vast uh, uh, volume which has the same conditions everywhere, and it's expanding the same way. The way to think of it is like raisins in a cake. Um, mm -hmm. As the cake is rising, which is space expanding, the raisins are separated from each other in a uniform fashion. And of course, raisins that are close to each other are moving relative to each other at a relatively low speed. But those that are separated by a large distance are moving away from each other faster. And that's the way to think about the expanding universe. It's actually space and time which are formulated by Einstein's theory of gravity, and you can sort of understand it. Now, you need dark matter, indeed, uh, to explain the rate of expansion, but you have evidence for dark matter also inside galaxies, because to explain the orbits of stars around the center of galaxies, uh, you need more matter than you see. And so there is invisible matter that keeps galaxies bound together and clusters of galaxies bound together. Otherwise, they would uh, fly apart. You know, the, the motion is too fast for the observed matter to keep it bound. That was a very concise explanation. I, I love that. Now, my question is, if you were in the middle section uh, as, as the explosion and not, not, not at the edge, whatever, but oh, the there is section. no middle. There is no. Well, I understand, but if you're just if in, in a light cone, if you are where we are, for example, wh wherever that is, if if everything was moving in, you know, everybody's coming out in this direction, but this is a faster speed. This is another speed. This is a slower speed. If you were there, wouldn't you see this one moving away from you and that one moving away from you from your point of view? Wouldn't no, you so see everything uh, going uh, away from you? This is the metaphor that I brought up. Just think about the raisins in a cake that is rising uniformly. Yeah. Uh, the raisins are separated from each other, irrespective of which raisin you are looking at. Uh, they are separated from each other the same way. You can sit on one raisin and see the others uh, separated from you. If you go to another raisin, it will be the same view. Right. And this cake is, as far as we can tell, has no edge to it. We haven't found the edge of the, of the expanding universe. Uh, and so just think about a cake that has an infinite size. Uh, that is rising uniformly. So everywhere the raisins are separated the same way. There is no center to the cake if it has no edge. I, I buy that. I've seen that argument before. My only question is, how is that different from a normal explosion here where the ah. particles are moving apart also in the same way you can say, but without any yeah. expansion of space because yeah, so, from okay. the par point so, of view of every little piece, it could look like everything is moving away from it. Okay, so the key is to realize that gravity is important in the sense that the expansion is not at a fixed speed. The speed is changing over time because gravity, for example, uh, attracts uh, particles to each other and so they slow down in the expansion early on in the universe. So initially the expansion was faster and then it slowed down. But amazingly, as the universe became rarefied, very recently, over the past half of the lifespan of the universe, uh, the uh, expansion started accelerating. Instead of slowing down, it uh, started to speed up. And uh, that is like having repulsive gravity. The question is, where did it come from? And uh, this is the cosmological constant that Einstein introduced to his equations. Another way to think of it is the vacuum has some mass per unit volume to it. And the vacuum in Einstein's gravity produces a repulsive uh, force that pushes galaxies apart at an ever increasing speed. And that is amazing, you know, and we don't fully understand where the vacuum energy is coming from. Uh, and, uh, you know, just to think about Newton seeing an apple fall on, its, on his head mm -hmm. uh, in the orchard of his family that gave him the idea of that gravity attracts, if uh, he was. Uh, surrounded by vacuum, uh, not uh, near Earth, he would see the apple run away from him at an ever-increasing speed. And that's repulsive gravity for you. And uh, we don't fully understand. So the bottom line is 
we don't really know what the universe is made of. We don't know what the dark matter is. I mean, we only know about ordinary matter, which makes up 17% of the matter. Uh, and we don't know what the dark matter is and we don't know what the dark energy is. Um, so we have a lot to learn. And despite the fact that we celebrate the accomplishments of scientists with the Nobel uh, Prize every year, you know, uh, I think uh, prizes are not as important as figuring out the world. And we are still at our infancy. And perhaps if we meet another civilization, we can ask them, what is the dark matter? What is the dark energy? Mm -hmm. My first question would be, what happened before the Big Bang? Mm -hmm. I would like to know that. I would in particular want to know whether our universe was created by scientists that know how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity and somehow created a baby universe, some quantum gravity engineers out there. I want to know that because as far as we know so far, the universe just started you know, at some point in time out of nothing. And I want to know if that was a choice made by a very advanced scientist. Well, since you gave me permission to call you Farm Boy, I'm going to say thank you very much, Farm Boy, for, <laughs> for this. But, but for the audience, I wanted to point out two words you used that show that you think big. You said, very recently, in, since the Big Bang, this happened. And that's, that very recently was six and a half billion years ago. So if you think that six and a half billion years ago is very recently, you, you're thinking pretty big. So, and thank you for doing that. And, and uh, very interesting. I'm really going to watch what happens with the evidence on, on whether you find the big pieces. And if not that, you know, even as you said, it doesn't matter whether it's natural or technology. We know it came from outside of our solar system. Now let's yeah. look for some other things. You know, it gives people meaning to mm -hmm. uh, have some religious beliefs in a superhuman entity. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, you know, we can use the tools of science to find superhuman entities. Mm -hmm. And um, it may be in the real world out there. Uh, and that may unify religion and science in, in a way, in a very interesting way that we will encounter an entity that can create miracles as far as we can tell and could have created the universe and can create life. Uh, and so let's uh, search for them. Absolutely. Talk somebody into it. You persuaded your wife, you can persuade more people into this, I'm sure of it. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, uh, Avi Loeb, for uh, joining us at, again after you did last year um, to share with the San Francisco audience and our worldwide audience on YouTube uh, your research and your ideas and uh, the fact you have another book, Interstellar. Um, and I want to thank Wonderfest once again for supporting the program. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 121st year of enlightened discussion. We hope you enjoyed that. I'm sure you did. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>